Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I recently celebrated a birthday. Well, my birthday, I guess a birthday, my birthday, whichever way you want to say it. And I had the best birthday present ever in that my husband and I both got our second COVID vaccination shots on my birthday. Like I said, best birthday present ever. And I, yeah, I thought it was really generous of me to share my birthday present with my husband. <laughs> uh, no, we, uh, we got our shots. And actually, one fun thing was that we were on the pediatric side of the office where we got our shots. And so we got clown, um, clown band-aids <laughs> when we were done. So it was very celebratory, right? Very, very celebratory. I also forgot to mention in the last episode, cannot believe I forgot to mention this. I was so excited about it and then poof, went completely out of my head. The last episode of the interview with Danny Gardner was my 200th interview for this podcast. How crazy is that? I... I know I've talked about my my hesitancy to start this podcast and how I got into the podcasting business in the first place. And as for someone who really never pictured herself doing a podcast, hosting a podcast, doing interviews, talking to authors, holy cow, 200 interviews. That's, um, well, that's almost exciting, as, as exciting or it's, it's on par with the with the birthday COVID shots, I gotta say. So lots of excitement happening in my life th- right now. Maybe it's weird excitement, but I'm going to go with it. I will celebrate my victories where I can find them. And I hope that you have victories big and small that you are also celebrating right now. At any rate, let's go ahead and talk about our book and our author for today. We are turning our attention to a memoir this week. It is Oppie's Berlin Diaries, My Quest to Understand My Grandfather's Nazi Past. The author is Gabriel Robinson. The description is as follows. After her mother's death, Gabriel Robinson found her grandfather's diaries and discovered that he had been a member of the Nazi party. Her memoir juxtaposes her grandfather's harrowing account serving as a doctor in the ruins of Berlin with her memories of his loving protection after the war and raises disturbing questions about the political responsibility we all carry as individuals. Not the longest description that we've ever had uh, to read from the back of a book, but definitely very, very accurate and, um, you know, Pithy, I guess you would say. It's it, it describes this perfectly. This is the story of, as it says, Gabriel finding her grandfather's diaries after her mother's death, finding out things that she had not known before about her grandfather, and the decision to research and look into that past to try to understand it a little bit more. We talk a little bit in the interview about how many of us often talk or think about what we would do in certain political situations, how we would respond, how we would act. And we always feel like we would act on the right side of history. Would we? I don't know. Uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm always projecting myself into, into, these, into these stories and into these uh, situations. And I don't know. I want to say, yeah, of course, if I were in Germany in the 1930s, I would say this. Absolutely not. I am not going to be a member of the Nazi party. 
no idea how I would react in that situation, honestly. So this is Gabrielle's attempt to understand why her grandfather did what he did. And like it says, um, alongside her own memories of her grandfather, because of course, he's her grandfather. He is, we all have images of our grandparents, especially as children. You know, our grandparents represent a certain I- ideal to us, depending on our relationship with us, with, with them. And so to try to, try to make sense of the picture she has in her head and the memories that she has of her grandfather with this new information that she has from his diaries. And I can only imagine that process and how difficult it may have been to go through that. But she does so with unflinching honesty throughout the book. She she tries to present as full a picture as possible of her grandfather, not only as her grandfather, but also as a human being with flaws and someone who made choices. And maybe maybe those choices were correct at the time, maybe they weren't, but she really does try to honestly figure out or understand, excuse me, her grandfather's motivations and why he did what he did without trying to make excuses or sugarcoat any of what she discovered. So let's go ahead and turn now to the interview with Gabriel Robinson. Again, the book is called Oppie's Berlin Diaries, My Quest to Understand My Grandfather's Nazi Past. Hi, Gabrielle. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I am so happy to have you. We are here to talk about your new book. It's called Oppie's Berlin Diaries. Um, my quest to understand my grandfather's Nazi past. Before we get to the book, though, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about yourself, I would appreciate it. Uh, yes, gladly. Um, I live in South Bend, in the Indiana, and until I came there, I, it was a place I'd never heard of before, and before that, I'd moved around a whole lot. At first, I think it was because of World War II and its aftermath. I was born in Berlin in 1942, and then um, my father was killed in the war a few months later, and when we lost our um, apartment to bombs, my mother, my grandmother, and myself fled Berlin. The only one that in the family left in the family who stayed behind was my grandfather because he was a doctor and he was needed. Um, we came to a little North German village and were put into a cottage of a farmer who understandably was not at all happy about having these city folks crowd him out of the little space he had. And when I think back on it, it seems like a different world. The cottage had no running water. There was an outhouse and there was a well outside. It seems so medieval when I think about it now where we, you know, have several bathrooms and so on. Um, and from there, I went to Vienna uh, because my mother went there. She couldn't find a job in this village except for picking potato beaters out of potato plants. And so she went to Vienna and eventually sent for me. And then I went to an Ursuline boarding school there and fell ill with scarlet fever and you know, kept being moved around a lot. Um, the probably happiest and most stable time of that in that time was my time with my grandfather, Api, as I called him, until his death um, in 1955. Um, and then after he died, I was I moved was moved around again a lot until the early 60s when my mother, who had been married, and so my stepfather, my mother, and myself came to the United States. And that's where I got my bachelor's degree and my master's degree. I was there for um, two years. Yeah, no, three years, maybe. Um, and after that, I got for, went for my PhD to London because my field was, I was a modern drama sort of person, and that was one of the big centers. And I married a Scots mathematician there. And after my PhD, we came back to the United States 
to teach because my son was and my son was born there too. Um, about 15 years later, I got a divorce, and that's when I came to South Bend. I thought only temporarily because I was headed again for a major university. But two things happened. Uh, one thing was that I just loved the students. Indiana University South Bend is a regional campus, so most of the students are local, and most of them are first-generation college students, older, often women, who sacrificed a lot to pay for college and to get this education. And I had never experienced anything like this. It was such a transforming experience for them, and it was such a gratifying experience uh, thing to be part of this and to help them, you know, gain a whole new perspective on the world. And the other even more important thing was that my son really settled in well. He loved the schools, he had lots of friends, and so I did not want to leave after that. And eventually I got married again, and that was even more reason to stay, and I never regretted it. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the book is called At Oppie's Berlin Diaries, My Quest to Understand My Grandfather's Nazi Past. Can you give an overview of the book? Your listeners who also are writers will know that often you get onto a subject totally by accident, by finding something, a document or uh, meeting somebody or so on. That's how it was with me. Um, it was after my mother's death that um, Mike and I went to her Vienna apartment and I still remember that evening. Uh, we had just had a long walk through the city and the vineyards and came home and I just sort of scanned her bookshelves to maybe pick up a book just before going to sleep and right high up on the shelf on the very top I found um, a 19th century novel that I really liked. So I got a chair and I climbed up, pulled that book down, and with it came two little green booklets. And so I put the book aside and opened those booklets and I immediately recognized my grandfather's handwriting because, you know, he had written poems for me to recite while I lived with him for special occasions and he had, you know, worked with me on my Latin. And so I didn't feel tired anymore and I started to read. And I read about his life in Berlin in 1945. These were daily accounts. And each one started with a greeting to us and it also ended that way. So it was kind of a form of a letter and uh, he would often say that this was one of the things that helped him survive, that he could write to us, even though he never knew whether we had actually survived after we fled Berlin. But the rest of it was just these horrendous details about um, medical bunkers without light or water or medication, with the dead simply being stressed outside, with the air being full of smoke and three million refugees from the east crowding into the city and, you know, all these horrendous details. So I decided right then and there I was going to write about this. And so I took the little booklets home with me to South Bend, but as I got more into it, um, it was sort of a strange experience. I kept seeing these two letters, P and G, and for a good part, I just read over it because I was so caught up in how my grandfather was brought to the point of collapse and all the things that were happening. But eventually, and I think i never forget that moment, It eventually it just struck me. I mean, uh, it just hit me. PG meant Parteigenos, a member of the party. And I realized that my grandfather had been a member of the Nazi party. I just sat there and my heart was pounding and my stomach was upset. I, I just couldn't go on. And I did exactly what my mother had done. I hit the diaries again. And I didn't even tell Mike about what I'd found. And 
this lasted for two years and eventually my secret burst out to Mike and he urged me to do it, but I still didn't. And strangely, what pushed me finally to go ahead and write about this anyway was a book from the United States. It was Edward Ball's Slaves in the Family. I was writing another book about African-American housing uh, segregation and read that as a background. And Ball says that when he told his family that he was going to write a history of the slaves his family had kept, they were outraged uh, and they were angry and vicious. One of them said um, something like, you're going to dig up our grandfather and hang him. And it gave him pause as it had me, but eventually Ball said he decided that he may not have been responsible for what happened in the past of his family, the slaves, but he was accountable. And that just seemed to so um, parallel my situation. It seemed to sort of speak to me directly. I was accountable. I had to confront this past that I had really not dealt with all my life. So that helped me to get going, although on the way I often still wondered, am I really exposing my grandfather to this shame? What would he have said, thought? Um, I know my mother probably would not have liked it because uh, she never wanted to talk about the war at all. She never, when the few questions I asked, I realized, you know, that was not a topic she wanted to deal with. So. In the end, I, saw, I hoped that since this is still a tribute to him and written with so much love, that he, and since he wanted those diaries out, he really protected them. Um, and when it's in very dangerous situation, he gave them into some kind of safekeeping and so on, that he might actually approve of this. It's time to take our first break of the podcast, but as we go through that break, just take a moment to think about how you would react or maybe you've had this experience and how you did react to finding out something about your parent or grandparent in such a way, something that had been hidden, something that you didn't know before. And just how would you, what would your reaction be? What set of emotions would you go through, et cetera? It's it's kind of crazy to ponder, right? We'll be talking a little bit more about Gabriel's, Gab, excuse me, Gabrielle's reactions once we return from the break. So you're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Podcast. I am speaking today with author Gabrielle Robinson. Before the break, she was describing the process of how she found her grandfather's diaries about his involvement in the Nazi party. She found those diaries after her mother's death. And then the process of what she went through as she tried to figure out what she was going to do with that information. Did she want anyone to know? She didn't even tell her husband, etc. So let's go ahead and return now to the interview. I can I can only imagine how many emotions you must have had going through this process. I mean, losing your grandfather at a fairly young age, you didn't know him when you were an adult and so we have different views of our of our elders, you know, when we're children than we do as an adult and so mm -hmm. I can only imagine that you know, learning 
all of the aspects of your grandfather instead of just the ones that you knew as a child and he was your grandpa and he and you know you loved him he loved you how right. how was that process for you as you went through writing it was it um well just how was that process for you well there were so many things you know one was that for me he has always been a pillar of strength and stability who had really brought stability into my life for this five years or so that I lived with him. And here I saw him distraught, unable to make any decision, or when he made a decision immediately to reverse himself, not trusting himself in doing the right thing in the situation and being so desperate. That was, uh, you know, I think maybe every child feels that way about a parent or grandparent, and then to suddenly see them so near, you know, a complete meltdown is, is hard to um, deal with. But of course, the main question was me trying to find out, uh, you know, as the subtitle said, why did he join the Nazi party? And I came up with a lot of explanations, but not really a complete, one complete answer. Uh, You know, there were a lot of explanations that he perfectly fit the profile of people who joined. He joined on May 1st, 1933, right shortly after Hitler had become chancellor. And, um, uh, you know, he was a conservative. He was a veteran of World War I. And, you know, there were all these reasons. But I never really uh, could answer it, uh, except that I also kept asking myself, well, what would I have done in this situation? You know, how would I have behaved? Uh, One always likes to think that one would have been brave and stood up against this terror. but. Most likely, I mean, I'm pretty sure I would not have been able to do um, any better than he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is really easy from a a different vantage point to say, well, I wouldn't have done that, but we don't know unless we're actually in a moment what we what we would do. Well, I just was along with this one thing that kept haunting me about him, too, was another um, African-American quote, Martin Luther King Jr., who said, um, boy, I'm just paraphrasing here, that we don't only have to repent the vitriolic actions of the bad people, but the terrible silence of the good people. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that clearly, I think my grandfather felt he had never hurt anyone uh, directly, and he had, in fact, um, continued to uh, help Jewish uh, patients, and he had, uh, I found a letter from a Jewish colleague who had uh, fled to South America who said that, you know, he was so grateful, and uh, he's, my grandfather, apart from a few family members, is the only one he stays in contact with, and so on. But there's Mm -hmm. still a responsibility. There's still that terrible silence. Right, I mean yeah. the political responsibility. Strangely, I think when I see you know young podcasters talking about the book or reviewing the book, this is one thing that resonates with them. Um, they kind of grab on for, onto it as the relevance for us today that we are politically responsible. That we can't just say, "Oh, that happened in the past; that has nothing to do with us." Um, yeah, I was surprised to see, uh, especially the young right now at this stage where we are politically right now, really mm-hmm. um, being interested in that mm-hmm. and singling that out. Yeah, that is that's encouraging, and I I see it as well. It's, it's it, especially in my nieces who are in their early twenties, and they're very, very involved and outspoken, and so. Yeah, it's very encouraging. So you started with your grandfather's diaries, and then where did you go from there? What kinds of research did you do to flesh out the story? Um, Being a um, college professor, of course, I did a lot of research. And um, to get more detail, to find more background, to educate myself on things I didn't know. And for all those listeners out there, and I hope there are many who want to tell their own story, 
research is really a wonderful tool to help you understand things better and uh, to throw a different light on and get a new perspective and understand things more deeply. Um, I don't know whether we have time. I would just like to give one example of something I found in the research. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, it's uh, one of the sort of standard books about Berlin 1945 is Anthony Beaver's book called The Fall of Berlin. And in that book, he describes, he talks about a, a Soviet journalist who had been in Stalingrad and thought that after Stalingrad and the horror of those mass murders and so on committed by the Germans, um, nothing could shock him again. And then he came with the field marshal. He was still with the field marshal and reporting on him. He came to Berlin. And as he was walking around the streets in rubble, as he was seeing the people dying in the streets and all that misery, he was shocked again. And on his path, he came to the zoo. The zoo in Berlin is right in the center, um, sort of uh, the Tiergarten, which is kind of Berlin's central park, and it's part of that. And he remembered that the largest gorilla in Europe was supposed to be housed there. So he wanted to find her, and he did. But of course, she was dead in her cage, as all the other animals were. But the keeper came out and they started to talk. And at one point he asked the keeper, and actually whenever I tell this story, I get goosebumps still. He asked the, pe uh, the keeper, was she fierce? And the keeper responded, no, she just roared loudly. And then he added, humans are fiercer. And I found that so, you know, capturing this whole situation I was describing, humans are fiercer, you know, uh, World War II, and of course, we have seen it since then, has seen so much evidence of man's inhumanity to man, humans are fiercer. It's, uh, I could have used it actually as a title, but I just used it as a title of a chapter. But I found that out through uh, research. Um, the teacher in me says one other thing here, uh, and that is a word of warning to people who are listening and thinking of writing and doing research. Don't get bogged down in the research. Um, because I've seen that so often that people do heaps and heaps of research and end up with, you know, folders of notes and just never make the jump to the writing. I would advise anyone who does the research, yes, you have to do a lot of it, uh, but do the research and the writing together. And at some point you have to call a halt, right? We know you could keep going, right? Uh, in my particular case, World War II, there are so many books I could never even, you know, uh, read, oh, 1% of them. So at some point you also have to call a halt. But Research is a great tool. Yeah, I, I, as you were saying that, I was just, I was just imagining myself. I could, I could easily imagine myself being the person that kept researching and kept researching and had folder upon folder. And then, at some point, I would look at all those folders and just be like, "It's too much. I, I can't even begin. To, I don't know where to begin." <laughs> right. Um, right. So, but I if you definitely... start writing, then things sort of begin to take shape, and you realize what areas you might want to do more in. You may also want to keep a timeline so that you and uh, you know make notes what you have, what would fit into that timeline so that when you start writing, you know where to find certain resources. But and at some point, you just call a halt. And with that, although you have to do it invariably, I don't think I've written a book that I didn't think afterwards, oh my God, I wish I had read this before. You know, that would have helped right. me. But you yeah. just can't do it all. No, no. And you're right about the, the, the amount of information that's available on World War II. My goodness, um, you, could, you could spend lifetimes trying to read it all. Um, right. Time for our second break of the podcast. When we come back, 
Gabrielle will be talking about what she hopes readers will take away from the book, as well as what she took away from the writing of this book. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. MC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Gabrielle Robinson about her book, Oppie's Berlin Diaries. She is talking about the experience of finding her grandfather's diaries, detailing his involvement in the Nazi party, how that turned into research that became this book. Let's go ahead and return now to the interview with Gabrielle. What do you hope that readers might take away from the book? A number of things. One is that I would like them to have a certain amount of compassion for my grandfather and see, as one writer said, volcanic eruptions of the 20th century that so impacted his life. He served in World War I and in World War II as a you know, man in his 50s by then, almost 60. And... Uh, it had a devastating effect. It killed his only son. It, he lost his practice and his livelihood and his home. Um, and he tried to do, you know, the best he can. And maybe people might also then want to reflect, what is the impact on history on my life? Because we are all impacted by the times we live in, by the history we've gone through and that has come before us. I love the uh, Faulkner quote who says, um, um, how is it called again? That the past is not dead, it's not even past. You know, the past is still with us. Um, and so I would like them to reflect on how the past has impacted their lives. But beyond that, my big sort of hope uh, takeaway is, which I sometimes I'm afraid of is maybe simple-minded, is that even though my grandfather comes from a different culture, spoke a different language, lived a wholly different life, and was a member of the Nazi party, that it reminds us nevertheless of our common humanity, that no matter how different we are in background and experiences, we share more than divides us. And I think that Strangely enough, this whole COVID nightmare has also brought that to light again. You know, so many people say and quote that we are in this together. And as a result, we really need to treat each other with compassion and with tolerance. Mm, yes, thank you for that. Um, what have you taken away from the writing of this book? For me personally, it has been um, a real, you know, giving me a new perspective on my own life and making me see my own past. In fact, that was also, again, an accident. I hadn't put myself into the book as much as, as it is now. I had mainly concentrated sort of on a chronological account of my grandfather, and I 
sent that to my agent and she came, wrote back quite in full, uh, I had an agent in London at the time, um, came back quite uh, encouragingly, but <laughs> ended by saying, you have to put more of yourself into this. And that sort of really uh, brought me up short because, you know, in all my previous books, they had either been academic books or local history books, but I was always at a safe distance. And now in this, I had to put myself into it. And that really gave me a whole new relationship to my own past and uh, also brought up a lot of fond memories of my grandfather that I hadn't thought about in so many years. So it was emotional. Uh, you know, cathartic is maybe an overused word, but it it really was uh, made me feel a bit differently about my own past and about my grandfather. You know, little scenes that I hadn't thought about, like every fall, he um, would say when it was sort of a windy day, "Come on, Bresian," as he called me, "let's build a kite." And we went into the basement and we built a kite. He did all the you know, the kind of cross-shaped thing with the exact balance, but I got to make the tail and color things and so on. And when it was finished, we'd go out and fly it. And on this one occasion, which was a really blustery day, um, we went out to fly it and my I couldn't hold on to the pull of it. So my grandfather took it and ran with it and I ran with him. And then a patient of his, this was in the meadows right across from where we live. And a patient of his sort of shouted to him, hello, Dr. Fraser. And he looked away for a moment and then he disappeared. And I looked and I couldn't see him and she couldn't either. And so I rushed to the spot where he was and he was sitting. He had fallen into a drainage ditch. This northern German climate is very moist and uh, wet and there are lots of drainage ditches in the meadows to make anything grow at all. And he sat there laughing. He was wet and he just was laughing. I jumped in with him and I laughed too and we watched how the kite soared high above us. It, it's so typical for him, the way he was. You know, he always brought joy and playfulness uh, into my life. He wasn't just playful, he was also really determined on my education. Um, everything, you know, we did in some ways was educational, but in a fun way. On walks, he would point out the history of buildings, you know, in Europe, there are lots of, there was an old nunnery there, the, the, one of the first nunneries of the Heath, and he would talk to me about what it was like at the time. He sometimes would say, let's go out at night, and we would study the night sky, and, uh, in spring, he made me kind of feel all the leaves and understand, you know, the different trees and so on. Um, so, you know, there was always this educational element, but he made it fun and enjoyable. Um, although, again, about something that came to me, how I must have disappointed him. Occasionally, he would walk into um, my room and say, Brechen, shall we do your Latin first or shall we play first? And clearly he would have liked me to pick, pick the first. And I invariably <laughs> picked the play first. But then oh, he sure. would really play with me. He wouldn't let on that he was disappointed. Um, and then we, but we still had to do our Latin as well. Right. <laughs> there are, there are a couple of pictures of you and your grandfather in the book, and they're very sweet. I mean, you, just he's he's pretty much beaming at you in both of the pictures that I'm thinking of, and uh, it it you can just tell that you you had a very sweet relationship. Um, so I'm I'm, gl I'm yes. very glad that you put the pictures in there. Time for our last break of the podcast, but. If you have been a longtime listener of the podcast, you know that I love pictures in books, in memoirs. I love pictures in general. I am that person that if you have pictures on your refrigerator or on your walls at your house, I will stare at them because I love seeing families and how they're represented in pictures. So I'm very happy that 
the pictures of Gabrielle and her grandfather were represented in this book. They are very sweet, as I said. So let's go ahead and take that next, that last break. And when we come back, Gabrielle will be talking about what she's working on now. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. and the conclusion of my interview with author Gabrielle Robinson. Are you working on uh, a new book now or taking a break from writing? What, do you, what are you up to now in terms of writing? I, um, I'm doing a lot of writing, but mainly sort of related to both this book and the book that went before, uh, which was called Better Homes of South Bend, an American Story of Courage. It's about... Um, people who came from the South in that big second migration during World War II to find jobs in the North. And then, as one of them put it, I left the South to get away from Jim Crow, and then I met Jim Crow in the North because clearly they came to South Bend to work at Studebaker, but there was so much discrimination. And what hurt them particularly was in housing, they were forced to live. Um, even the federal housing that was provided was strictly segregated, and theirs was right near the slums and the center of the industrial part. And they felt that they hadn't come up here and uprooted themselves and give their children this kind of environment where there were bars and slums and the noise of the um, machinery and the big industry that we had, Studebaker and Oliver Plough mainly. Um, And so they were trying to find a nice place to live. And in a way that shouldn't have been a story at all, but it was, and it was a long struggle for them to find a nice place to live. And, uh, you know, I'm talking about the um, discrimination that really was federally Uh, You know, the FHA said that the only stable housing is segregated housing and that you needed protective covenants to keep it this way. And um, the National Association of Realtors said the same thing, harmonious neighborhoods, you know, you should never introduce another race into harmonious neighborhoods and so on. Um, So it wasn't just a local fight, it was really a national atmosphere at the time. And I described what it took for them to be successful, which they were. Um, And what surprised me most about this in a way was not only that they succeeded, which was amazing in itself, they kind of formed the first um, building co-op in Indiana. um, And many of them didn't have high school education. But the thing that's so amazing, which people now, you know, talk about what's the effect on the next generation. Over 50% of these kids whose parents hadn't finished high school for a good part went to college and they became teachers and a professor and lawyers and, and so on. And so the huge importance of a good and stable environment for kids to grow up in was really brought home to me. Mm-hmm. And I also... Um, uh, I wanted to end, you know, I wanted to write just that story and end with it, but of course then I looked around, even South Bend, but generally, and this is just 
an individual victory in an overall battle that's still going on. Right now, because of the situation right now, the political situation right now, and all the trials and the shootings and so on, I'm being asked to do a lot of talking and writing about that topic. Sure, yeah. Um, not an easy topic and not easy, you know, there's there's a lot going on right now. Very difficult um, topic yes. to talk about. Yeah. So uh, you are in academia, um, which involves a lot of writing anyway, but uh, is did you always think that you wanted to write books or did that come to you kind of through the process of your teaching career? How did you decide to start um, writing books? Yeah, I, well, I've always written, you know, uh, in, in, you know, we have, uh, I went to the, I grew up in um, the 1950s in Germany. And actually one thing, I'm jumping around here, but uh, one thing I would like to say about that was in 1950s, Germany did not acknowledge their recent past. It was never mentioned. Um, not in school, not in at home, nowhere. It was as if it had never happened. It was only in the 1960s that Germans finally realized that we do have to account, we do have to take responsibility. And they, from then on, did in a big way. Um, I don't know whether you've uh, been in Germany um, since then. Uh, one little thing they did, uh, they... Well, they did, you know, they did reparations, they uh, rebuilt all the synagogues, they really were trying to make this a friendly place for Jewish people to come back to, and I think increasingly they have. But they also, if you go in a German town or city, you see what they call Stolpersteine, which means stumbling stones in front of lots and lots of houses. These are uh, round stones that stick out a bit. You're supposed to stumble over them with a name and a date. And that's the name of the people who were taken from there and the date when they were taken to be transported to a concentration camp. And the whole intent is that they want you to be brought up short from your daily routines and daily life and think of what happened not that many years ago. And I was saying what a great education I got in high school. I mean, and we did a lot of writing. I wrote essays in English and French and even in Latin. Um, my education was so good that I left right after high school and I got my bachelor's and master's, my bachelor's degree at uh, University of Illinois, my master's at Columbia within three years of that. And that was not that I was a brilliant student. It was just that I had such a terrific background. All and I right. got my PhD then another two or three years later. But that, you know, was just hard work and writing. But I was writing for all of these things. And from then on, I kept on writing. I wrote articles. I've written, oh, I don't know, 40 or some articles and eight books. And, you know, I was always writing. I, I love... Uh, the writing, but I also, I don't know whether you know that Stephen King quote that always uh, comes to my mind. I write to find out what I think, because that is certainly true of me. I'm mm -hmm. not one of these people who can kind of plan it all out and know exactly what I will say when and how it all hangs together. I do write to find out what I think, and it brings clarity to me, the process of writing. Mm hmm Lovely. You ha you mentioned earlier about you know doing research and and writing at the same time. Do you have other advice for aspiring authors or even anyone who's thinking of maybe writing some of their family history? Oh yes, I mean that could take us another hour. Yes, but briefly, do get started if you want to write your family history or something about yourself. Do get started. It's not just a thing you do for yourself. It's an important endeavor. You are preserving a part of the past. Whether you write just for your family and your kids or whether you write for a wider audience, it is a really important thing to do. 
So I would urge you to get started. And I would, uh, I love to help people who do this. And I'm helping people all across the country, often just via email or via phone call. So um, your listeners would uh, could feel free to get in touch with me. Um, or if you don't want to do that, talk with somebody else. While you talk, while you talk about what you might want to do and so on, sometimes things become clear to you or to your listener. They say, oh, hey, why don't you start with that or something? It's it's a very useful uh, thing to communicate and to talk and to think about it out loud. Um, mm-hmm. But getting started is the main thing. Get started, yes. do research, do the writing. And yes. it, it will get, bring so many benefits. And you, you mentioned, you know, that you help people and to get in contact. Um, so segueing from that, can you tell uh, my listeners, your website and any social media where you may be available? Right. Everything is under Gabrielle Robinson. My website is GabrielleRobinson.com. My Facebook is Gabrielle Robinson. LinkedIn is Gabrielle Robinson. Twitter, at I'm at, at G. Robinson author. Slightly different. And Instagram, I'm Gabrielle Robinson, 97. When you take time to read for yourself, um, and you might not have a lot of time outside of doing research, but when you take time to read for yourself, uh, do you have favorite authors or genres that you like to read? Uh, I was thinking about that, and there's two books that I'm, one I just finished and one I'm in the process of reading, that are very different but have the same message. One is, and that's one I'm, I'm just, starting really the Heather McGee book, the recent one, it's called The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. And she's using the kind of metaphor of the drained swimming pool where the white population, rather than opening the swimming pool up to to minorities, African Americans, rather drained it so that nobody could enjoy it. You know, racism hurting all of us, and yet how we can prosper together. The other author is Peter Wohlleben. He's a German, um, and he's famous for his first book, well, for all of them, but especially the first book, which was called The Secret Life of Trees. I don't know whether you've heard about that. When I read that, I was just amazed. He talks about how trees communicate with each other through their roots and how they help each other. When a tree sees that his neighboring tree is sick or struggling, he sends them nutrition. Or when there's an insect infestation in his tree, he warns all the other trees. They are a community. They are, you know, prospering together in a way. So both these books really talk about how we are part of a great social construct that encompasses us all from the plants to the trees to the animals to us and from people from all across the world so those are the two books and then i read every lewis penny mystery as soon as it comes out <laughs> she, uh, dang it you're, you people keep mentioning her and she's on my two my my to be read list i have got to start reading her <laughs> Oh, she is, she is really a great writer. She's beyond just a mystery writer. And I also read all these wonderful and moving accounts that are coming out from by uh, children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. Most recently, I read Hidden in Berlin by Evelyn Grossman, who describes to teenagers who were later to become her parents uh, in Berlin, hiding out from Nazi persecution. Um, Mm -hmm. Ariana Neumann's book, um, When Time Stopped, she wrote me a beautiful blurb too for my book, um, is another one. There are so many, Helen Fremont's The Escape Artist. Um, It shows too how World War II, you know, what in line with what Faulkner said, the past is not even past, how World War II still throws its terrifying long shadow over 
these generations, these children and grandchildren have been impacted by the experience their parents went through. And mm-hmm. there's just um, a lot of new books always coming out. And I am also very moved by the um, reception I got from the Jewish community here. Um, I have been probably the most um, humbling and amazing um, experience for a German woman or German girl who had written this book was that I was invited to light the seventh candle at the Holocaust at the Holocaust Remembrance at our local temple, at one of our local temple, Temple de Sal. Um, wow. But I have been giving readings uh, at Jewish communities. I've got a standing ovation from one of them. I, um, my own one and only standing ovation. They have, have bought my books. I'm getting so much support and I'm writing, uh, well, it, it's, it's done now, but for a long time I've written a um, monthly newsletter entry in the Jewish Federation newsletter uh, of this area of St. Joseph Valley, um, in which I have interviewed Holocaust survivors, but also others, um, to mainly older people to talk about their experience of growing up Jewish, both here and, uh, you know, their experience uh, in Germany, if, if that was the case. And I'm friends with many of them still. Well, thank you for that. And um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed speaking with you. Um, I am in awe of the journey that you must have gone through to write this book. So thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you again to Gabrielle for joining me for not only joining me to talk about this book, but for also writing this book. I think it is so important for us to understand not only the past, but how our families interacted with that past, how our families were involved in that past, not to beat up, beat ourselves up about, oh my gosh, this happened and my, now I'm a terrible person because of what my ancestors did, but no, to understand where your why your why your life is why it is is because of so many different pieces and so many different events and things that involved your ancestors affect now how you live today it's just a fact of of life and a fact of the way time progresses so it's really under, important to understand those those historical events and how our ancestors were a part of those historical events. So thank you to Gabrielle for writing this book and for doing that really hard work of the research and trying to understand her grandfather through this different lens that she discovered later in life uh, um, with her, her, her beloved grandfather's involvement in the Nazi party. So very appreciative of Gabrielle and this book. I'm very appreciative of you also, my listeners, and I hope that you will join me for the next episode when I will be speaking with author Priscilla Patton about her second novel in her Twin Cities mystery. This one is called Should Grace Fail? And so we'll be talking to Priscilla about that on the next the next episode of the GSMC Book Review Podcast. In the meantime, as I said, I hope that you are having a good day. I hope you are celebrating your victories, big and small, whatever they may be. If you're a fan of this podcast, please do do all those things that I say at the end of every episode. Subscribe, write a review, hit like, whatever it is on the platform that you're listening to, write a comment maybe about something you heard in this episode. Also follow on social media, GSMC Book Review Podcast, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Would love to hear from you, my listeners who are on those social media platforms. So I I have to, not I have to, but I do say all of these things at the end of each episode because doing those taking those actions really does help this podcast to get out to more book lovers like yourselves. Keep celebrating those victories. Hope you're having a great day. Hope that great day continues. If you're not having a great day, I hope your day improves in some way and you find something that 
be a person, a, a place, a thing, a book that can help you to improve th- your mood or the day that you're having, whatever it might be. And I really hope that, especially if you do need an improvement in your day, that your day involves plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.